I would like to move on to Danny. Um, hi. He says, hi, Danny. He says that in a way, threat actors are just like bandits within dense forests. Um, Danny Henderson Jr. is a senior information security advisor at SecureWorks. He will share his tale of tricksters that leverage services through search engine optimization, manipulation, and Google AdWords abuse. Then he has quite an impressive career. He spent 14 years serving the U.S. public sector in various roles, and I'm sure that he'll talk a little bit about that too. Danny, you have the bridge. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yeah, perfect. Sweet. So I am going to be handling your presentation as your speaker and your storyteller. I also have Bitey and, in the mood of the story, a D20 die. All right, so let's begin. We begin this tale with a dramatic reenactment of a real event of someone who wanted to get a treasure, but in the end, receive malware. This story, is the curse of the Mirage Forest. So we have some chapters to go over. We'll start with the prologue, the introductions of the event, and then we'll go into understanding the threat landscape. So the purpose of the threat, understanding the threat landscape is to know how things came to be, how mal malvertisements came to be, and how it has shaped even worse this year, which will then tie in to the incident response tale that I have itself. And lastly, I will start sharing some trade craft, uh, some investigation approaches that many people can take to assist in their investigations to identify the threat actors infrastructure and utilize what services free or non-free that's provided by the company that will by your uh, company that will be able to aid you in your research. So the prologue, we get our beautiful map and we got our threat actor, just an ordinary bandit went to the misty forest, or in this case, understanding the way that malvertisements work, make everything more confusing for normal people who traverse through the internet. And he is the new keeper. So about myself, <laughs> let's see. So about myself, I am, oops, no, there we go. So about myself, I've been with the military for 12 years as enlisted. Then I was civilian for two years doing contract and was a public service employee. Got bachelor's, master's, and various certifications. Now I work at SecureWorks as an information security professional, but I'm also an independent game developer. I do, I work with Blue Team Village, for community involvement and dead pixel security. I like Dungeons and Dragons as per this story tells. And oh, by the way, I do dungeon mastering. So if you ever need a dungeon master. <laughs> All right, we shall kick off with the story after the adventurer, uh, the adventurer from far away. So the main purpose of this is to understand the threat environment, how everything came to be you're wandering to the misty woods. So the threat landscape is dealing with malvertisements in general. Malvertisements was discovered back in 2007 through various researchers. This was at the time of the Adobe Flash vulnerability that was exploited on Rhapsody and MySpace websites. And it slowly started evolving more and more throughout the years, where you have mod modern ads such as Google DoubleClick and other various type of Flash-related activities, which has gone away once Flash died, at least that uh, threat att attack vector. Rest in peace, Flash. Overall, the malvertisements are a, were very perfect for watering hole attacks 
because everyone goes to the site and the threat actor, once they compromise that site, gets a wide net of users who go through, which leads us to the pro um, process of infection. It's leveraged through the, um, through the compromised web server so it can be your content management systems or the website itself. And the users who visit the website receive that drive-by download. And there's even times that you'll be they'll be redirected to the bad onto the malicious site. A more popular one that was utilized long ago, but ha have decreasingly been used is the exploit kits. So those generally targeted Flash, Microsoft Silverlight, and Oracle. Now to note about it, it started dying away once people started edging away from Internet Explorer and Microsoft's attempts to deprecate Internet Explorer. Mozilla and Chrome were, once those, once those were established, threat actors started not having an attack vector through the exploit kits anymore. However, around October, mid-October, researchers discovered that there are some threat actors that were doing some tests on Chromium. And they, it was successful enough to give a indicator of what, syst, what Windows version that they're using. So that is a precourse to an indicator that you could start seeing exploit kits coming back targeting Chromium browsers. But that's more to come as the years develop. Now that we've, now that we've gone into part of the deep dive of how advertisements came to be, we're going to be more targeted towards the topics at hand. So Google Analytics has been a very good attack vector that the threat actors have abused. And Google's analytics have been abused. Prior to 2021, they've all been, they've mostly been scam oriented. So there's two, two aspects of, of the Google analytics. One, one of them, this one is not just a Google. E, um, and that one is the search engine optimization. Now, web developers love using it because it helps get their website's exposure. And more exposure the, the website gets is better for the analytics, puts their pages on the front on the um, first search. Threat actors saw the same thing, hence why they started using it around for a couple of things. Most the most infamous one that happened this year was the Goot Loader, which was a JavaScript based rat. So it was leveraged when the threat actors compromised mostly WordPress or any other content management system as a delivery mechanism. Now, when visitors would visit those websites, the, there's a JavaScript that would do analytics to see what the IP address is, what, the, what uh, type of browser they're using and so forth. And just to go back, let's rewind it a bit. So most of these are through searches. So people are doing a lot of searches. So Goot Loader, for example, was done when people are looking for certain documents, such as trying to, down, um, trying to download a law template of trying to put maybe a document to help them with getting their rent. What's the rent, what's the rent template for, say, Romania? Threat actors would have that server pop up as the result. Now, going back to the site where the person goes in, if the user met the threshold, then the threat actor's website will show something like this on the top right corner, where it looks like a fake forum post. And someone has the direct link, which will take you to an another malicious link to actually get obtain the file. Now, if the person never did not meet the requirements, that compromised website will just show normal text that looks like it 
makes sense. And then it starts becoming more gibberish as you read on. So it lets you know that it, it, you're not a potential target. So when people download the document, it was actually a JavaScript file. And once they double click the JavaScript file, the malware started running. And this allowed for other attack back, other programs to be installed, particularly ransomware. So as we are now in the age of ransomware, this was a good opportunity for threat actors to leverage that. And another one is Google AdWord. Now, we, this one involved the Z Loader event, but before we go to the Z Loader, we first start seeing Google AdWord being used maliciously was around 2014, the tail end of it. It was a scam campaign that went by, it was covered, published in January, 2015. That was at least the first instance of the at Google AdWord being used. Now, Google AdWord, if you look on the bottom right of the screen, it just shows the website and that particular ad that you, um, like a sponsored ad to get the person to the website faster. Now, this case, with the screenshot, this covers the target event, which occurred in 2017, where anyone who's trying to go to the big retail targets would be redirected to a malicious, a scam call center. So in that, uh, that case, actually, another instance that we've had was um, the Brave browser incident as well. Now, 2021, this deals with this um, back to the Z loader incident. Z loader was usually sent through phishing, but this year was the first instance that we've seen that went um, that went through an indirect attack. So the person would do a search for what they're looking for. The particular pieces were either Zoom or Team Viewer and the, it would show the result for a user to go to the website and they would start getting the malware. Now this malware had a dropper that had a lower rate of detection. So at the time uh, that it kicked off, no malware was able to, do, no security solution was able to detect the malware. Now that we recovered the Z loader, this actually leads to detail of the incident response story itself. We call it, the encounter. We present the victim who has risen from his grave to approach the adventure and to tell the adventurer his tales. So that previous dramatic reenactment is this user who has come to tell his tale. So the tales of the victim, he at this time, the user, at that time, the user was preparing for a meeting at school. And when they were trying to search for Zoom the, for the application, the ad had popped up. Now I'm going to note in the screenshot that this is a notional provided image as there was not, no other reports that showed how it looked like from the victim's point of view. So I felt that would be appropriate to show you all the point of view of the victim. So this is what the victim saw. They saw the Zoom download, what they thought was Zoom, but what they did not catch was the trap. This led to a critical failure in their perception check. They did not know that they were the victim to malware. So once the user in, um, in that file came in the form of an installer. So once they used the Zoom installer, they started going into installing it, of course. So once it started installing, it loaded multiple packages. One of those packages also includes the Atera agent, which was used as a backdoor. 
one of the one of the scripts that ran or one of the first functions that the malware did was run a PowerShell script to disable window, uh, Windows Defender. So once it started to, once it disabled the Windows Defender, it started adding its additional payload. And one of those payloads was Crowd, was the CrowdStrike, sorry, not CrowdStrike, Cobalt Strike. Cobalt Strike being used. Now, I highlight this in black because this one triggered an alert. The threat actor, he was there for about a couple of days and he had intermittent connectivity due to being off the, the due to the user, the victim, being off of the company resources. So he was off the VPN that, that it was used to connect to the company environment. So the threat actor had to just live in the, in the guy's land in his own personal network for some time. But once he got access again, he used a couple of tools to start enumerate the environment. He used AD Find to enumerate the users, the computers, the organization units, and the shares. He had a lot of information from that. Then he tried to use the Invoke Share Finder PowerShell script to enumerate the shares, which when we found that out or when we uncovered that, there was no information from that host. So that one looked like it was unsuccessful. Now we go into the hero's turn. So back to the part where I highlighted earlier that it was a Cobalt Strike signature. We reviewed our security solutions to, um, to, to, um, to further investigate any previous activity that followed that. So once we started, drilling in and getting our findings, we were able to confirm the threat. Roll initiative. Once we rolled our initiative, we had our party. One of the first instances that we had to do was isolate the host. However, we ran to the issue that at the time, the user system was not connected in a way that we could isolate it. So we pass it off to the next team that's in our 15, the network team. They had to use the network access to control to completely remove the person from the network. Once that system was off the network, we worked with the identity access management team to have the user's account disabled. So we're able to, through that um, point, we were able to isolate the host prevent the threat actors from having his turn in initiative. However, there were a couple of questions after this encounter. One, how far did he get in? Two, was there anything else compromised? Three, how much information did he have? So we had to work with the compromised system that was confirmed to be able to get further information. So this goes into the analysis phase. And this is what's considered post, uh, post encounter. So we had a lot of other teams to work with. We had a, we stood up a bridge, brought up the stakeholders. We had the local IT team help us with getting the triage data so we can do our investigation to know what was on the computer, what was, the, what was in the event logs, what was in the network log, what was the user's browser logs. And because we identified that the user, that the compromised account, the threat actor was able to enumerate the Active Directory, we had the Active Directory team reset the Kerberos Golden Ticket. Next up, we had to work with the Privilege Access Management team to lock down the domain admins. So we needed to be able to be analyzed all the logs for a couple of days. However, we had to make sure that none of the ad, domain admins could take those accounts, which would allow the threat actor to take it if he had those credentials. And then from there, the SOC had to identify and review any other indicators. Now, once we start going through there, that took some time. So in the meanwhile, we had another part of our team monitoring the network during that lockdown period. 
So one part of the team was to focus on any domain admin activity because some were allowed because they need to do some specific work, while the others were to analyze all the artifacts that they found. The good thing was that only one of the systems was compromised. The uh, they we found eventually found another one, but it didn't install the malware. So that one thankfully was not compromised. But overall, it was only scoped to one system. And we were able to establish that the threat actor did not get in. So once the analysis period ended over the over that lockdown period, operations were allowed to resume on a big scale, but we still had a lot of work to do to analyze everything that happened. Let's drink, be merry. This is where we get to share some of the um, trade craft on investigation approaches. How do we find how do we find the infrastructure of the bad guy? How do we find everything during that triage point? Because we it's gonna take a while for actual threat intelligence team, threat intelligence to provide further information. But there are things that you can do during the incident response phase that gives you a bit of that homegrown threat intelligence capability. So during the investigation, we had the preliminary, preliminary artifacts that was found during the triage period from the local IT team. So earlier I mentioned the event log, browser logs and so forth. We, so we had some leads of what the, what the person was going to. We have one of the domains is not gonna be listed on here because it's too long but you'll see that in a bit. But the file names was the Zoom installer and the Tim, which was the Z loader itself. Now that installer, I was given an MD5 hash, we were given MD5 hash and we reviewed it. The screenshot below was of that MD5 hash, but it did not say Zoom, it said team viewer. So upon initial look, because everyone was still like trying to figure things out, it was almost written off as, okay, that's just a regular Zoom installer. But then you look at the domain that it was pulled from, which was a teams um, dash viewers.site, which matched the same way as the Zoom video.site. Those were not legitimate. So we started understanding that this was not a legitimate software. So I'm also gonna note at that time, uh, so this image was recently, so, but at the time this was marked as clean. So no, no, there were no malicious indicators, though there was some community comments at the time. So we started tracing around from the site to other domains that were connected. Now, unfortunately, with the finding the associate domain for the ITW URLs, that requires an enterprise account, but you can still see what it communicated to and the name from the free version. Next up. So this was the long one that I mentioned earlier. This was where the person went to the, to the initial URL to make the down, when they went to the zoom.com through Google search. This is what it led to. And then the downloader was from the next site. So we use Whois to find, some, find the indicators. There was some commonalities during the infrastructure search from the the registrant name, who they reg uh, registered to, the e email, phone number, we start getting the pattern. And in that pattern, there was also the creation date. So at the time, this was around September, September the 7th through 9th. So we start seeing that the infrastructure registered on the 26th of August and another one 
prior um, event was on the 18th of August. So we start to understand that there was infrastructure set up a week or so prior. And then this one was set up the day before the compromise, which was a Cobalt Strike 2 server. That's why this one's different. So URL scan. So if anyone's like me, and I'll, I'll admit to this, before I would always do just private scan, but I stopped myself. And you can all you can use URL scan here to search for to use the search function to see if anyone else was uh, was tracking this, and you get the indicators that someone was tracking it by the search results. So at the time, this would be more useful. Time of the incident, it'd be more useful. But you get an indicator that this started at least on the second. Now to bring the story together, it took the threat actor one or two weeks to stand up the infrastructure before the start of their operation. So it shows how fast they can get things stood up when it, for preparation for when it's time. So we understood that it probably started at least September and the lures used during that time was Zoom and TeamViewer. Now, Sentinel Labs published this on published this report on the 13th, and most of the details from that report corroborated with the initial analysis. So there was some vindicate. There's a, is a vindicating feeling when you see how accurate you are when you do the analysis of the event at the time of the incident to get the feel of hey, how was I right on this? Some takeaways from here. Malvertisements are not going away and they may potentially become more of a common uh, indirect attack factor for ransomware as we've been seeing the age of ransomware kicking off the past two years. And with the report of the targeting of Chromium and the testing rather, exploit kits may come back. And these were the references that I've used for this report to get an understanding of advertisements. I thank a few people, thank a few people for this. This is one person who is the pixel artist who created these. He has two projects. He also created some of my, my one of my custom pixel artists arts of the threat actor battle. And Dunum, who's the person who created my my avatar and my team SecureWorks. This is my contact information. And pending further questions, that is the end of the tale. Thank you so much, Danny. What a lovely tale. Um, and also, I love the hat. And I saw it in one of your slides and the pixels and, and, and everything. Um, I think everyone had fun in, in the past 20 or 30 minutes. Um, we only have, I think, about five minutes for questions. <laughs> <laughs> All good. But um, I was wondering... What do you feel that's going to happen on a ransomware front in, in the coming year? Because we're preparing to wrap up 2021. And how do you think these would impact um, malvertis ma malvertising in general? They'll probably see it more as an additional means of, uh, like normal, it, it may possibly ramp up or may not. The thing about the advertisements, you don't see it as much as you do phishing sort of deal. So it's more or less, I'll probably try to take it when it's unexpected. Something I didn't note was that the one operation with Gootloader, that took th about 300 servers to manage because it was that was not a small scale operation to manage those servers. So that's how they were able to boost the, <clears throat> boost the um, search engine optimization. So something like that is probably going to be very costly, but may, they may see the, see the benefit of it. Now, Google um, Map, so Google AdWords will probably continue because we've already seen it back in 2014. We've seen it 2017. And Google, they've been, they've been, they've been trying. We've seen some efforts in them in blocking off malicious adware, but 
they can't be everywhere. Mm -hmm. And where do you think the defenders should focus their efforts? And that one's um, that one's t um, that one's tougher. So one of the things we also looked into is ad, um, ad, um, pushing for ad blockers within the within the um, com not just community but also corporate workplaces. They should start using the ad blockers because even the government, even NSA and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency have re recommended that people use ad blockers. So that may have to be extending to the companies themselves. Now, Google, now Google's um, search engine is going to be tougher to to manage, just because it's all it's all based on the search results. But the ad blocker actually probably would have worked against that one because that one was JavaScript based. Mm -hmm. But anything like the AdWords is going to be a little tougher. Yeah, and one last question. Sure. I, th I think that you're based in Bucharest, right? Yes. Yes, I okay. am. Okay, tell us about our exper your experience in, in Romania. <laughs> ah, so I came here last year, 2021, during the pandemic, July, actually. I, I flown in from Germany. That mm -hmm. was when I said my farewell to the government forever and decided to make Romania start of my new life and new home. I've enjoyed it here. I got a good group of people that I work with. I enjoy my the company I'm with. I am, I'm pretty happy with everyone that I interviewed with when I was trying to find a place to stay in Europe. So I can see this being, being a new home once I get start trying to learn Romanian. That's going to be one of my to-do lists. I know that's going to be tough, but that's going to be one of my uh, to-do lists. But I, I like it here. I've enjoyed the time. I really do want to be able to start meeting the InfoSec community more in, pers in person one of these days. I'm looking forward to next year when I can meet the other security professionals in person. Yeah, but but your team, as far as I know, is, is fantastic. And you won't get um, bored <laughs> just by talking to them. What do your friends, I mean, you have friends both in, in Germany and the US. What yep. do they tell you uh, when you say that you've moved here? Uh, or, most, most of them are used to it because I lived in Japan. I lived in Korea. Part of my military life was being everywhere around the world. But doing it as a government, as now a non-government person uh it's, it's usually fun trying to sync up with them because some of the folks i work with are also part of my game development team so i have to sync with their time zone with their time zones in the u.s and my friends in germany they they want me to come visit them again soon i do miss them the close friends of mine so they they said like there's a place for me still that's great. Thank you so much for um, being here with us, Danny, and we look forward to meeting you in person. 